Yo guys, what is up? Max in our last Epoch video, and today we're going over my in-depth guide to Endgame in Last Epoch. Now, Last Epoch's Endgame uh, can be a little bit overwhelming. There's a lot to do, and how you're supposed to be doing it, what you should be doing, uh, and the order that you should be doing it uh, can be a little bit confusing. Uh, I want to, in this video, go over what Endgame is, so that if you're curious about just the general, like, what there is to do at Endgame, we're going to cover that. But if you're looking to progress the most efficiently at Endgame, get your gear, get your character powered up, I want to go over that as well. I hope you enjoy the guide. Let's get right into it. So we're going to start with the very basics of Endgame, and there will be timestamps at the bottom of the video. So if you already know what Endgame is, and you're looking for, like, Endgame corruption monolith progression, you can skip to that section uh, where we're going to be talking about that. But we're going to start with the basics and we'll work our way up. So to start us off, the basics of Last Epoch's Endgame systems uh, at its core are revolving around the monoliths of fate. Now, you can start doing monoliths as early as like level 14, 15. As soon as you unlock the end of time area, you can start doing monoliths. I do recommend completing your story and getting all of your passives uh, your passive points and your idle slots before you really start trying to grind endgame. Uh, it'll tell you how many passive points you can earn from the campaign and your idle slot rewards. You're going to want to make sure that you do all the side quests to do your passive point rewards and idle slots that will help you transition into the endgame uh, so that you're not missing out on any power. Now, once you get to the monoliths of fate, uh, they work a little bit similar to like mapping in Path of Exile. Um, so I've got like advanced options on mine because I'm a little bit further. You're just just going to be in the like normal end game ignore that option uh, but the goal of the monoliths is to increase your stability and ultimately fight a boss at the end of them now the best way to progress your stability at the fastest rate uh, i didn't do a great job of it here but it's to work diagonally um, the way that these work is most of the time it's fastest not going straight up straight to the right straight to the left uh, but actually working in a diagonal so going down to the side down to the side down to the side down to the side uh, will allow you to progress your monolith faster because you're going to be moving away in multiple directions uh, and then once you get into the corruption it's easier to find more paths and not get blocked when you're moving side away or diagonal uh, than it is if you're trying to move in one direction linearly uh, the map layouts just don't work all that well when you're trying to move in one's flat direction uh, so try to be moving like down uh, I, it, in, a, in a diagonal pathing um, but the further that you go from the center this will be the center the more timeline stability that you can earn so if we hover over this, uh, this echo will give us modifiers. It's going to give us enemy modifiers, player modifiers, echo rewards, uh, and the echo rewards is what you want to pay attention to. This gives us 20 timeline stability and up to 24 bonus timeline stability. So what this means is that if I complete this, I'm going to get guaranteed affix shards. I'm going to get guaranteed 20 timeline stability. And then depending on the amount of enemies that I kill in the monolith will earn me up to a 24 bonus timeline stability. If you're wondering if you should just be rushing to the objectives in these monoliths, the answer is yes, but you're going to be wanting to use your skills and your abilities to kill enemies as you move because you can earn up to more than you would just completing it if you're killing ads. Um, so you're going to want to be killing enemies in these monoliths as you move to the objective to get the fastest progression. Um, and that's what the like up to or bonus stability uh, is that how that works. Now in these different monoliths, um, they don't really tell you until you're in the empowered and that's when you're gonna wanna start caring about them. But each monolith has exclusive echo rewards and exclusive blessings. Now when you're doing normal monoliths, it'll offer you a choice of different blessings. Uh, as you can see, I've got some of these blessings here. And these blessings will help you find what you're looking for on your build and also improve your character. So if you hold down the alt button uh, on any of the blessings that you find, whether that's in the monolith or actually in your inventory, you can see what their potential roles are. Um, and so, for example, I grabbed Promise of Death. This is an 11% chance to shred necrotic resistance. My range on this is 10 to 20%. So the monolith that this dropped from, I would want to go do it again. One, to get a higher empowered roll. But two, I'm, it's important for me to shred necrotic resistance on my build. And I got a really low roll on this. So 
don't worry about the blessings, the roles that you get as you're progressing through the monolith, but it's something that you're going to want to min-max later on. But once you've completed a monolith or earn stability on it, so if we check out this monolith, uh, as you earn progression or stability, you're going to unlock quest echoes. These quest echoes serve as side quests. You're going to need to do two side quests on each monolith before you unlock the boss, which is the final thing. Once you've unlocked the boss, you can if you beat the boss, you unlock the next monolith. Um, I recommend trying, for example, on the Fall of the Outcast, it splits between the level 62 and the 66. Uh, I recommend trying to go for the higher levels so that you earn progression faster and working your way up the right if you're going 66 and 75 um, to get more experience. But obviously, if you're struggling, you can go for the like lower, easier monoliths, which are Stolen Lands and Blood, Frost, and Death. But eventually, you are going to want to do all the monoliths. Now, once you complete all of the monoliths, uh, or not all of them. Once you can get to the top, you're going to unlock the monolith of, uh, of the last rune, Age of Winter, and Spirits of Fire. You need to complete all of these. And then once you do complete all of these monoliths uh, and beat their bosses, you're going to want to come to this center. Um, it doesn't, the game doesn't do like a fantastic job of telling you to come to the center. Uh, but in between all of these monoliths is this little stone here. Um, and if you come to the little stone here, it'll actually let you activate it once you've beaten them. And this is what unlocks the like full end game, uh, which is empowered monoliths. Once you unlock empowered monoliths, then every monolith you can do again, but enemies will be higher level. Uh, mine is like currently bugged. It just says no translation found in UI, but this would normally say empowered monoliths. Now empowered monoliths will set the enemy level to level 100 in all of them. And it'll also give you a minimum of 100 corruption. Um, with actual no maximum corruption, corruption increases monster health and damage and increases the item rarity and experience gained. So if we come to this monolith, this one I've been working on for a while, um, let me move my camera. Uh, you can see that I have 260 corruption. So this is a monolith I've been working on that I've been increasing my corruption in. Uh, you'll also see that I have four gaze of Oribus, uh, and these are all kind of end game mechanics. So once you start in a, uh, 100 monolith, one thing to note is you're going to get exclusive echo rewards. In this timeline, Echoes have rewards that grant unique or set melee weapons, swords, axes, maces, daggers, and pole arms. Uh, I am here in this monolith because it's going to give me exclusive caster weapons. Uh, this is going to give me wands and staves, uh, which I am working on a caster necrotic, uh, necrotic warlock build. So it's really important for me to be able to farm these kind of weapons. So that's why this is the monolith that I've been pushing out first. One thing to identify if you're following a build guide is what is the most important piece of gear. If you really want a chest piece or you really want a unique helmet, uh, different monoliths, you can find uh, the guide on max roll, uh, but different monoliths will have like more dedicated drops. Uh, you can go up to them and look, and they'll also have different blessings. So for example, uh, you can see below each monolith what the blessing is. I rolled on this monolith. I haven't done the empowered version, but I rolled spell damage, leeches health. I don't need this for my build. This monolith can actually drop me crit multiplier, which I really do need for my build. So one thing once you get to empowered monoliths is going and fixing all of your blessings, which is great. And the other thing that you're going to want to focus on is pushing your monolith and increasing your corruption. Now, corruption is the end game scaler. This is your like difficulty. Corruption will directly increase enemy health, currently at 260 corruption. The enemies that I'm going to be fighting against have 236% more health and damage. More corruption, more health and damage. Now, the way to increase your corruption is the same way that you were doing increasing your stability. Now, you're just going to be working your way diagonal from the timeline start, uh, and it'll, the game will allow you to push pretty far until you start encountering all of these. Uh, these are Oribus. Oribus is a boss fight that will reset your echo web, but it'll grant you bonus corruption. Now, as you can see, when I hover over these, it's going to say that I get 14 corruption plus 31 corruption from Gaze of Oribus. Now, how did I get plus 31 corruption from Gaze of Oribus? Every time that you beat the timeline boss, uh, you will unlock 
uh, one stack of gaze. When you're doing Empowered Monoliths, you no longer need to do the optional side quests. You don't need to do them at all, um, but you do need to kill the boss. And every time you kill the boss, you get one stack of gaze. When you do a, uh, a fight of Oribus or fight Oribus, you're going to get corruption based off of how far that it is from the start. So if we look, for example, uh, here, this is closer. I'm going to get 10 corruption and 31 from Geza Oribus. Versus here, I'm going to get 14 Corruption and 31. The 31 will stay stagnant because that's just Gaze, but how far I am from the center uh, will change on the like top stat. So 10 there, 5 Corruption here. Now, in order to efficiently push your Corruption quickly, uh, you're going to want to just move as far away from the center as you can and kill the boss as many times as you can so that you can get the most amount of stacks of Gaze of Oribus. However, there is a caveat to that. So every time that you fight Oribus with stacks, you're going to get more corruption if you beat him, but you also have the, uh, you have the chance uh, if you die, or not the chance, if you die, you lose all of your stacks of Gaze of Oribus. So if I've, I've been fighting on this monolith for about maybe an hour and a half now to build up four stacks of Gaze. If I go fight Oribus right now and I die... I will lose all of that progression. All of those stacks go away, and I'll go back to having no stacks, and it'll take me longer to push my gaze. Just going to be talking over my recording real quick, but the most efficient way to farm corruption is by getting around two to three stacks of Gaze of Oribus and then fighting the boss. Um, the reason for this is, one, you're going to want to get multiple stacks because as you push further out in the monolith, you're going to earn more stability on nodes that are further from the center. So if you kill gate, if you fight Oribis after getting one stack, the monolith will reset and you're gonna need to work your way all the way back out uh, far away from the center to earn fast progression. When you kill the boss and you're already far out, it gets even faster to get more stacks of gaze because you're already clearing nodes that are far out from the center and those nodes that are far out will give you more stability faster. However, it is not efficient to stack up like more than five stacks of gaze because the more corruption that you have, the more stability that you're actually going to earn. If we take a look at my stolen lance monolith, which is 305 corruption, doing the very starter node can earn me over 100 corruption on just the very first one and it'll only go up from there. And that is because the more corruption that I get, the more stability that I'm gonna earn. So it actually becomes easier and easier to push your progression and go higher and higher, it becomes faster as you get later into the game. It's obviously going to become a lot harder. Enemies are going to get more health and more damage, but the grind is the hardest when you start out and it gets easier later. Uh, if we go, for example, to the end, ending the storm, which is a monolith that's level 100 corruption, I haven't pushed this monolith out at all. Um, it's going to take me a lot longer to get those... Uh, stability to push this monolith up because now when you look at these starting ones i'm only going to earn up to like 65 stability on clearing one of these however because the devs of this game are geniuses they made a catch-up mechanic so the monoliths that you haven't pushed will actually get a bonus to the corruption that you're doing based off of how high your highest monolith is so if we go to this monolith the black sun this is one that i have started pushing out Still only corruption level 100. I don't have any stacks of gaze. But if I went and cleared a monolith or, or a uh, Oribus, I'm going to get up to 150 or sorry, I'm going to get 57 bonus corruption uh, just by clearing this. And I haven't even gone that far from the center. This has to do with the catch up mechanic. The higher your main monolith is, the more bonus corruption that all of your other monoliths get. Um, when I got one of my monoliths to 200, I was able to get my next monolith up 100 on my very first kill of Oribus because you get so much bonus corruption in your other monoliths to push out uh, and get that corruption faster. Um, that is why it's so important when you're starting out to pick a monolith that you think is going to be beneficial for your build maybe it's got a blessing that's really important maybe it drops axes and you're using axes in your build maybe it's dropping chess pieces and you really need a really important chess piece for your build but you're going to want to focus on one monolith 
stack up its corruption. And then if you start having troubles in that monolith, you can go do your other monoliths and they'll build up that corruption way faster. And you can also get those blessings and those higher resistances. For example, um, this Reign of Dragons monolith, I'm a necrotic build. Resistance is really important for me. Uh, when I cleared it in non-empowered, it gave me 38 necrotic resistance. When I cleared it in empowered, I got 58 necrotic resistance. So all of the monoliths that you would have not done again in empowered, you can go do again to get better blessings and better blessing rolls. Um, and that is kind of the core loop and progression of the endgame monolith system. Showing on screen is what each monolith drops. So if you're playing a bow build, you're probably going to be pushing out Fall of the Outcast as your main thing. If you're a spellcaster like I am, you're probably going to be pushing the Stolen Lance as your main one. Uh, if you're looking for particular helmets, the Black Sun's got it. Blood, Frost, and Death is for body armors. If you're looking for like Exsanguinous or certain body armors, uh, Ending the Storm is for gloves. Follow the Empire is belts. If you're a melee build, you're probably looking to grind Reign of Dragons for sword, axes, maces, daggers, and spears. The Last Ruin has your relics. The Age of Winter is where you're going to be getting your rings and your amulets. You're going to want to probably come to this after you get your main stuff and spirits of fire is where boots drop next part of the end game which are dungeons and arenas now in order to do any of this activity of dungeons and arenas you're going to need keys uh we've got the arena which you fight up to wave 40 and then you fight a boss um, and as you're fighting in the arena, you can pick modifiers that the boss will drop. So let's say you're looking for an exalted weapon. You can pick for the boss to drop either an exalted weapon or an exalted amulet. But if you pick weapon, maybe the boss will get more health. And you get choices as you progress into the higher tiers. Uh, and arenas are very cool. Um, there is like set arenas and also endless arenas. And arenas one and two are kind of like early to mid game. Arenas level three and four are going to be kind of your more like end gamey scalers or levels. Uh, and this applies to all of the dungeon and keys. One and two, you should be pretty fine to run uh, on your build if you're in monoliths. And then three and four of the tiers are things that you're going to want to be able to do uh, once you're in empowered monoliths and your build is starting to work. So speaking of legendary potential, that leads us to our next part of the end game, which are dungeons and arenas. Now, in order to do a dungeon or arena, you're going to need a key. These keys drop in the monoliths. Uh, there's tons of ways to get them. As you can see, I've got plenty more than I could ever uh, use uh, as you're getting more as you're doing content. Um, but these arenas and dungeons have tiers. Tiers one and two on most of these dungeons and arenas are things that you should be able to do while you're doing monoliths. They are endgame, so when you're doing normal monoliths, you'll probably be able to clear one and two tiers of the arenas and the dungeons, and then tier three and four are going to be like endgame, kind of more empowered difficulty. Um, and so I wouldn't recommend trying a T3 or a T4 of an arena or a dungeon until you're further into the endgame. Now, let's go over each one. To start, we've got the arena. Arena is what you would imagine it to be. You're fighting waves of enemies, and as you level up those waves, as you get to the different waves, you can actually pick modifiers. And this is a theme throughout all of the dungeons and arenas, is that you kind of get to pick your rewards while also giving yourself more difficulty. So, for example, while you're doing an arena, it might offer you an option of getting a legendary weapon or getting an exalted weapon. If you go for the legendary weapon, which will drop from the boss, the boss might have more HP and do more damage, but you're going to get a better reward. Or you could go for the Exalted, where you're going to get a worse reward, but the boss has less HP and less damage. Uh, so you kind of get to pick what rewards you're getting from while doing an Arena, and also kind of pick your modifiers. Now, there is also an Arena Key of Memory. This allows you to start at Wave 100. This is very much endgame. Uh, but if you've passed level 100, it's an arena key of memory. It'll remember your highest wave completed so that you can just jump right into it. This allows you to do the like endless arena. And if you get to wave 300, you can start at wave 300 and continue on or, or try again on the wave that you failed at or died. This allows you to not have to spend hours grinding up to where you died or failed uh, just so that you could die again. Uh, so that's a really, really nice system. And now we talk about our dungeon keys. 
we've got the Temporal Sanctum, Soulfire Bastion, and Lightless Arbor. So our first dungeon to talk about is Temporal Sanctum. This is probably the most popular dungeon uh, that you will see people running uh, because it has to do with Legendary Potential. Um, now, Legendary Potential is part of the gear rarity system for endgame so uniques that you drop on the ground can drop with legendary potential set gear the green gear cannot drop with legendary potential and purple gear or anything else cannot drop with legendary potential only uniques which are the orange gear can drop with legendary potential so crafting with legendary potential requires a unique that's got legendary potential on it and an exalted item uh, that is matching, meaning that if you're going to use a helmet uh, as your base with legendary potential, you need an exalted helmet. If you're doing it a craft on a body armor, you need body armor. If you're doing it on a wand, you need a wand, and so on and so forth. Now, this is a craft that I did on stream. Um, this is the best in slot helmet for my build, the Bone Clamor Barbute. I already had one. This is what when you get legendary, uh, it looks like. As you can see, this helmet says it's a unique. But the Bone Clamor one that I crafted on is a Legendary. Uh, so that what's like Legendary Potential means. When you craft it, you're going to turn it into a Legendary. Now, a Legendary Potential 1 item will absorb 1 Affix. So I grabbed this helmet. This helmet, uh, for me, is an Exalted Helmet. It had a chance to apply Damned on Hit, Flat Damage for Curses, Armor, and Necrotic Resistance. All great things for my build. Uh, and I really wanted it to hit the damned on hit or the, the best thing it could have dropped uh, was plus spell damage for curses. But because I only have one legendary potential, I'm only going to get one of these affixes and it's completely random what affix it grabs. Um, and obviously, if you get an item with four legendary potential, it will just absorb the entire item. Uh, and that's why four legendary potential is so, like, overpowered. You're basically infusing two items together entirely. Uh, getting something to drop with four LP is almost uh, impossible. Uh, it's very, very difficult. Uh, the highest I've found so far is three legendary potential. But what you do is you put both your legendary and your exalted into this crafting machine... Um, gonna speed it up. I hit the like cash button and then you're going to phase shift uh, to the different area and there you can grab your legendary. I unfortunately grabbed uh, armor. So it grabbed the armor affix out of all the things that it could have grabbed, which was the worst thing it could have possibly grabbed. And obviously this is just all RNG. So I got unlucky. Uh, my other helmet that I'd already been using was better, uh, but that is crafting with legendary potential. It's one of the best end game crafting systems in a game uh that i've played personally because obviously when you're playing these arpgs there's like legendaries that you get while well early and those legendaries that you get when you're playing early fall off at the end game and they no longer can be used even if you really liked them however the legendaries that you get super early uh have a tendency to drop with more legendary potential at least it feels that way so now you could get a legendary that or a unique that is not that great, but it dropped with three legendary potential, and you, you can combine a crazy item into it, uh, and then it be, could become amazing for your build. If there's a body armor that gives you a ton of damage, but not a lot of survivability, but it drops with two legendary potential, you could add 36% increased HP and more health regen on it, and then you're solving the issue of a low survivability piece by adding survivability and keeping all of the damage it's a very cool mechanic it allows for like super unique items per player because you're the items that you're gonna get are gonna be very different from items of other players uh but it's a ton of fun and it's totally random the other dungeons have a similar theme in this kind of like risk reward system uh the Soulfire bastion uh allows you to introduce a new mechanic that is revolving around souls uh, you will get a soul shield, basically, that you get to pick if it protects you from fire damage or necrotic damage. Um, and as you collect souls, you can protect yourself from incoming damage of enemies. Uh, and there's going to be lots of fire damage that you can, like, swap the shield on the fly to protect you against incoming fire attacks or incoming necrotic attacks. This is very important for the boss fight. Um, but the souls that you gather from your enemies, you can use to increase your protection and survivability in the dungeon or you can gamble those souls to get better items and rewards. And once again, it's a whole kind of risk reward system where you can risk your life and your survivability to get better items. Uh, but if you die in any of these dungeons or arenas, you lose all your loot and get kicked out. 
um, and you lose the key. So cool system there. And the Lightless Arbor is also a similar system uh, where you've got a cool boss fight and there's different like uh, modifiers that you can add to the enemies for better loot or better damage. Uh, or the enemies deal more damage. And at the end, there's kind of like a gambling system where you can spend gold uh, to get better rewards. And it'll offer you like, oh, do you want a sword? Uh, and it's going to cost you 1,500 gold. And if you say, no, I don't want a sword, the next thing's going to cost more. And you can spend tons and tons of gold. It's probably the biggest gold sink. Uh, things go up hundreds of thousands of gold. But you can get some crazy rewards out of it. Guys, that is going to do it for our end game guide. Uh, in Last Epoch, you've got dungeons, you've got arenas, and you've got monoliths. The big like core part of the end game is pushing monoliths and increasing your corruption. As you push your corruption, you're going to get better gear and higher legendary potential gear uh, to go and do dungeons and fight those bosses and get better gear from that. Um, and you're just going to keep kind of going back and forth, doing different arenas, uh, different things for different challenges, depending on the gear that you want, getting gold in the monoliths and then spending it in the dungeons. Uh, it's a really cool end game loop. Uh, and I think for a game that just came out, it's pretty fantastic. I'm excited to see how they build on it with upcoming seasons and adding seasonal bosses and, and new mechanics and new ways to get loot. Uh, but I hope this guide helped you. If you found it informative, if you learned anything new, I do appreciate you dropping a like, comment, and hey, maybe even subscribing. I'll catch you all in the next one. Take care. Peace.